Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Good to see faces again. Uh, we see more and more faces more often, so that's a, that's a good thing. Sorry, you have to put up in my face, but that's, that's, all, that's all you got. Uh, so we're really excited to have uh, Department of Revenue Secretary Bark up here, John Koskinen, and some other staff folks are going to talk a little bit about our economy. Um, everybody's been in hiding for 18 months, so now we get to find out what's been going on, learn a little bit about the budget. Uh, we've had uh, Secretary Barca and John up here before, so it's great to great to see them again. I see a couple of people grab point root beers, which is a, which is a good thing. We had a special treat back there. So I'm going to shut up because you, you didn't come here to hear me. You came here to hear from Secretary Barca. So please help me welcome Secretary Barca. slideshow up here. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Great to be with you all. And uh, I was looking around and I saw my former colleague, uh, Representative Shankland here, who's the highest ranking political person, I think. So maybe you want to just say a couple words of welcome people and I'll kick it off after that. Sure. Well, I think this is my third Portage County Business Council event in three days. And that is testament to the hard work of all the staff at the Portage County Business Council. So thank you so much for hosting our Secretary of Revenue and Department of Revenue staff who think this topic is incredibly important and I appreciate the significant attendance of people online in addition to in person and the close partnership between the state, counties and municipalities. Um, we appreciate Secretary Barca your willingness to travel here frequently and to be a resource for all of us. So with that, thank you again and looking forward to the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Congressman Shankler. I know we've got some municipal and county officials and uh, and key business leaders both here and uh, apparently tuning in virtually. So kudos to you, first of all, Todd and your organization for having us back here again. We had such a wonderful visit a couple of years ago. We always learned so much when we're together. We'd love to hear your input as well. So again, uh, after our deputy secretary does a little quiz for all of you, um, uh, that sort of fun facts we want to talk to you about. We'd love to hear your input on what you think about where the economy is going and any input that you want to give us. Uh, first, of course, I have to at least recognize that tremendous victory that Milwaukee Bucks yesterday. Uh, I know uh, in central Wisconsin, you look to the Packers a little bit more, a little bit closer, but I can tell you uh, that uh, victory is very important to us, uh, not only in terms of the morale of the state, but also economically, because we actually make money, uh, believe it or not, through having the Bucks here. And I was one of the four legislative leaders that helped to negotiate that. In fact, I called Speaker Walsh yesterday morning. I said, I just looked on StubHub, we could go for 1600 bucks, be up in the rafters, you know, and celebrate uh, that work we all did to bring the box here. But, uh, but you know, it's ironic because uh, when you add up the cost versus the income, we make uh, about $4 million above our costs every single year. And that's because something a lot of people don't realize, but every time LeBron James shows up by Milwaukee, we get, an increment for that daily salary. And the, his daily salary, I would you know, venture to guess is probably higher than all of our annual salaries. Um, it's pretty remarkable. And, uh, um, but you know, we're obviously just thrilled uh, with the extra added income, big for tourism, big for exposure, both for Milwaukee and I think for the state of Wisconsin as a whole. So I just can't help but mention it. Uh, I don't know how many people had time to watch any of the series, but it was just a, a riveting series. Each one was close and uh, interesting and fascinating and uh, so terrific for Wisconsin there. So now uh, from there, I think I'll move on to, uh, you know, things that are, you know, affecting all of us. Obviously, if, uh, you know, we've got John Koskinen and we'll have Emily Canfield, our economists, and they'll tell you how this recession we went through was a public health driven recession. And that's why they will also tell you how vital it is that we not let the Delta variants uh, invade Wisconsin and cause flare-ups like you're seeing in LA and other places where uh, they've had some real difficulties uh, and we're hoping to avoid that. As you can see in Wisconsin, we've done pretty well. In fact, for most of the time when vaccines first came out, Wisconsin led the nation. We were first, second, or third in terms of the number of people getting vaccinated. And that was very important. And uh, the governor here, we're here, he would say, it's because of the partnerships. And really we had just remarkable partnerships with the county health departments, with the hospital systems, with clinics, government even authorized for dentists to be able to get vaccines. And it had a big impact. And now we're sort of reaching that point where you're hitting sort of either uh, vaccine hesitant people or people in some cases that just can't find the time or get off of work. I was talking uh, with Jim Featherstone who owns a publishing or is the, uh, 
chairman of the board of your publishing company here, and he said he's worked hard to try and convince his staff to get vaccinated. He says he's got about a 50-50 ratio, and they even offered to let people have time off to go get vaccinated. I know that one of the things the federal government did is uh, they will pay empl uh, employers to you know take one day off for staff to go and get vaccinated, and certainly we encourage that because uh, we've got to get to that 70% threshold. And as you can see, for the state as a whole, we're at 51% that have gotten their first dose. For adults, we're doing a little better at 62. And that's where we especially would like to get to 70. Now, where we've really done well have been people age 65 or older. And that's an important variable. In fact, I caught John Kasich on the news the other day, former governor of Ohio. And I served with him in Congress. We were friends. We worked together on things. So I have a high respect for him. And he was saying, look, he said, when people say, this is a political thing. He said, I don't fully buy it. And I, it really hit me because I never really thought about this. He said, look at the people over 65. When you've got in Wisconsin, we're doing better than most. But when you've got 81% of them completed the series, 83%, that's people that, you know, lean more red, lean more blue, may have different views. But obviously, uh, yeah, I'd say older and wiser. They recognize how important it is. And uh, thank goodness that, you know, they did get vaccinated because they're the ones we especially want to be vaccinated because they're the ones that have more comorbidities, people that could be harder hit if they do in fact get, you know, the COVID. So uh, anyway, I thought that was sort of an interesting point. And obviously we're really trying to encourage that we get to that 70 to 80% uh, place because then we can keep out the Delta variant and other variants that are sure to follow. Um, now, just talk a little bit about the budget bill. Act 58, um, the governor signed that uh, week before last. I was uh, fortunate to be with them to talk about the revenue elements of this and uh, how it leads to economic prosperity, which is something that, you know, I wake up every morning as to our economists and the, the team that I have here. Uh, you know, that's one of the things we're most, uh, you know, uh, concerned with making sure that we have the right kind of economic atmosphere that we can grow and expand our state. And while I'm at that, maybe I'll quickly, you're going to meet them later, but David Casey's our deputy secretary in the back. He'll be speaking on a little quiz. Maria Garrel of Passix, our assistant deputy, and, uh, and John Koskin, you know, and he'll, he'll be speaking again too. So, um, but, you know, one of the nice things, uh, you know, in terms of the way in which we navigated during the pandemic is uh, businesses, you know, nationwide did pretty well. And you'll see from uh, Mr. Coxon's presentation, Wisconsin did particularly well too, especially manufacturing, which is big in Wisconsin, and certain sectors of the economy did extremely well. And as a consequence, you know, we had a, a $4 billion surplus, which is unheard of. We've never had that before, but that led to being able to provide the largest tax break we've ever had in the history of the state. And, um, you know, so one of the real pluses of that is that, uh, you know, it'll put money in people's pockets and people have money in their pockets. They're going to go out, they're going to buy the goods and services that small, medium-sized businesses in particular produce right here in Wisconsin. So that's something that's very important. In addition, the governor did make a veto to use $100 million more in, in, in funds for education, you know, for former for superintendent of schools, of course. That's probably the highest priority is. But also, it's important because of workforce. As we all know, pre-pandemic, our biggest issue is finding the right workforce and being able to have the best trained workers. Wisconsin's always been known for that. And that certainly is one of our top goals is to have a world-class workforce. And you can only do that with investments in education. We'll talk more about that. But anyway, uh, there's still work to be done, the governor felt. I'm gonna highlight that in a minute. But another couple things that are very important. We finally met one of the, the longstanding goals that we've had that we haven't had in Wisconsin for about 30 years since uh, you know one of my favorite governors, Tommy Thompson, was governor. We did the two-thirds funding of education, and and you know Governor Eagers being a first superintendent, he made that his top priority, and that's one of the reasons he was willing to sign the budget. That's important not only for educational outcomes, which we've all talked about, workforce, but it's also important for property tax relief. So it, it works both ways, and it's a very important goal to have achieved. Then secondly, from workforce, $72 million was invested for tech college, which also helps the tech colleges and for property tax relief as well. So that was very important. And then child independent tax care claimers will be able to claim 50% for the first time of the federal credit, which is also something very important 
uh, for people who have dependents. I, people I, I personally uh, feel, uh, you know, my heart goes out to are some of my nieces and nephews that are working for 15, 16 bucks an hour, have a couple of kids and are trying to raise a family. So to the degree we can give tax relief to them, it really does make a difference, I think. And then also for the first time, we've exempted all active duty personnel for the veterans in the state. And that's important because that helps keep them in the state of Wisconsin. For the most part, uh, you know, uh, many of them relocate in order to avoid taxes because they're being deployed. There are bases around the country. So now we're hoping that's gonna make more of them be Wisconsin citizens so that when they're done with their military service, which of course we're all so appreciative of that they'll move back to Wisconsin to help fulfill our workforce. Um, another very important goal, the governor put in his first budget and we had a little bit to do with that at Department of Revenue because just two weeks before the governor introduced his first budget when he was first elected, I had 10 of the top 15 uh, CEOs or C-suite uh, personnel flying to Madison to meet with us in our conference room and said the number one thing we could do for economic prosperity in their estimation would be to have a much more healthy research and development credit. And representing the Kenosha Mercenary area for many years, uh, George Whitaker, who's been with uh, Case New Holland for 40 years, he explained to me how, look, we can do research and we can do, you know, build uh, back holes or build agricultural implements anywhere in the country. But if we do the research in Racine, Wisconsin, we're much more likely to have the product built there. So that's why it's so important. I'm glad that this budget, we built a strong coalition of business uh, um, uh, coalitions, uh, you know, from everything from the WMC to the NFIB to many of the chambers who supported this very strongly. So I'm glad this time the legislature did pass it. I think it's going to be a big plus for us. Um, and then 200 million was set aside for the personal property tax. Uh, you know, as you all know, that's very important for smallest of businesses like restaurants and others. It's, you know, we reached a point now that it's really not worth the revenue to have them keep fulfilling that. But well, we've got to get it right. So the governor, you know, as we, we tried negotiating, in fact, I was in Speaker Voss's office till uh, from 8.30 in the morning till 6.30 at night, trying to get to a final package. I just met yesterday with the Personal Property Tax Coalition. So we're going to work in earnest to try and find that right pathway so we can do it right. To be quite frank, uh, and I was in the legislature at the time, but when they did the patterns, machinery, and tools exemption for personal property tax, they didn't get it right. We got sued, um, caused major problems with administration. And that wasn't me. That was my predecessor, Secretary Chandler, who I'm friends with. And, uh, you know, so it's very important we do this right, though. So we're going to keep working very hard in our department on that. A couple other things that didn't make in the budget. And the reason why I tell you about these is that just like the R&D credit, these are the things we're going to keep pushing towards that we think are the key priorities for economic prosperity. Things like creating a $200 million fund to assess small businesses, uh, assist small businesses affected by the pandemic, particularly with the retraining and with rehiring employees. We can see this workforce issue being a big one. We want to have more money dedicated to workforce. So that's another big one. Um, you know, the governor proposed a $100 million venture capital fund. That's something I'm very familiar with because actually Governor Walker had asked me when he was governor to serve in a task force headed by former Secretary Brewer from the Thompson administration. And this is what we proposed, but we weren't able to get it done. So we're trying to bring that back again. Very important for entrepreneurship and making sure that there's funds available. So we keep in particular young people who come up with new ideas to stay and develop them right here in Wisconsin. Another thing, uh, and I won't hit all of them, you can read all these, but a couple others that really stand out to me. I've been serving on WDC's board since it was created 10 years ago. And uh, having a block grant can make sure that when you've got, you know, Todd, a project right here in Stevens Point, that we can get block grant money to work in cooperation with our regional economic development groups and our chambers. And so that's why we think that one's important. Just a couple other things. Uh, again, $8 million for local workforce development boards. I'll bet you some of you serve on your local workforce development board. That's another priority they got left on the table we're going to push hard for. And then just one more I'm going to mention. And that's affordable workforce housing. As I travel state, as I do often, uh, more virtually than personally, the last year and a half. But what we hear is many times people, you know, that are getting jobs in small business, they can't even afford to live in the communities that they're at. So affordable housing has become so much more important. So we want to have a fund to help to uh, 
uh, ensure that we're building affordable workforce housing, that's another priority we're gonna keep pushing for. Um, I'm gonna go on from there. Just a couple other previous tax law changes. I wanna make sure you're aware of that we passed in previous budgets um, and also as separate bills. Uh, we've had a really successful time with the Department of Revenue working with our standing committees, the Assembly Ways and Means and the uh, Senate Revenue Committee. They work on a very bipartisan basis. It's just really terrific. Uh, almost virtually every bill we've had have passed unanimously through trying to reach a consensus, which is very important. But medical insurance deduction for the self-employed. The only people that couldn't deduct their entire premiums were the self-employed. That's not good for your business community. We finally got that done as Wisconsin Act 1, which is the first bill we've ever signed the law this session. Also, historic rehab. That tax credit, we had a group of developers approach us and say, you know, if we could claim these credits up front, um, then we could monetize them and we could take on more complicated historic rehab projects. So just so you're aware, that's now the law. So, you know, places like Findor for others, I think, could take advantage of that going forward. And then uh, the PPP double benefit. Normally, we've never in the history uh, uh, of Wisconsin or the IRS have allowed people that got a grant to then also deduct it. But the governor felt, given the, the, the depth of the pandemic, that he felt in this case we should allow for that and also insisted that for the CARES Act money, that you could deduct your expenses for that as well. Um, that probably won't happen again, frankly. Um, CARES Act money, just a few of the kinds of programs. We've been able to administer many of these at DOR. We just finished, the, or we're close to finishing the Wisconsin Tomorrow program, if any of you have applied for that. Um, and uh, now we're, we're working on the hotel and lodging grant program as we speak. And of course, hotel lodging and many of the restaurants and service industries. I don't know if uh, our economists will talk about the K-shaped recovery, but they're still struggling to some degree. Um, stimulus money, I just want to make sure you're aware that, you know, we had an unprecedented amount of stimulus and that's what led to much of the surplus that we had. But I'll leave that for the economists to talk about. At least it gives you a little bit of overview of the depth of the money that's come back to Wisconsin, which has been very important in our recovery. The American Rescue Act plan, which just passed uh, in, in January of this year. A couple of things to be aware of. If you own a restaurant, $28 billion set aside on the federal level. So be aware that there are monies available. Um, also, they've set aside $3 billion for the Commerce Department in particular, um, that'll remain available through September of 2022. So there will be money available there for economic adjustments. So for those industries in particular that are really hurting, you know, make sure you're reaching out to, uh, you know, to Todd, his group, your legislators, uh, because they may be able to help you to tap into some of those funds. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, one thing we take great pride in is, uh, is having a lot of the visualizations uh, to have data that's available for you to know everything from exports in Wisconsin to how your money's being spent in the federal or, I mean, on a state or a local level. You, if you just Google Wisconsin Department of Revenue and you hit Viz, V-I-Z for visualizations, you'll find it. Or if you hit Badger, B-D-G-R, that's a unit the governor encouraged us to create, a business development and government uh, relations department to particularly serve small businesses. Uh, you can reach us that way. Here's just some of the kinds of things. We have uh, information available for entrepreneurs and businesses to do like a one-stop type shop through getting information. So that's what I have available for you. I'm going to turn it over now to our senior uh, economist, John Koskinen, and then at the end, we'll all answer questions and maybe take any other feedback or thoughts that you have. But thank you so much. It's great to be here and students want to be with you again. Thanks. You got the wrong guy in tech, let me tell you that for sure. I'm afraid I'm going to trip over all these cables. I, yeah, what I need you to do is yep. uh, uh, start. well, on the PowerPoint side, we need to do the uh, yep. Yep. slide view. Slide view, right. Hang on. I got to wait till this. 
Why won't that bar get out of my way? Because that's your zoom link. What's that? Go to the upper right hand corner. Yeah. With the, the middle, uh, you don't want to minimize it, but grab, grab not there. The middle, in the middle, the, the it looks like a line right now. You want oh, me yeah. to do this for you? No, I got it. Yeah. Hang <laughs> on, you got it. Yeah, that minimized it. So restore it again, and then grab the, the bar and slide the PowerPoint. There you go, like that. But you have the wrong one up now. I wish I had that picture on my slide presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Todd, isn't that, isn't that the wrong? Yeah, that's Emily. So we want. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We can show you where that's located. Really? Where's Where John's? Here's John's. All right. Just down the river. Yep. Yeah, right on the river. Right on the river. Okay. So, from the beginning. There we go. Okay. We got it. Yes. I'm all set. Perfect. Sorry. Um, we're really going to quickly recap sort of what happened in the pandemic very shortly because that's bad news and everybody wants to get past it and then start sharing how we have moved into an economic expansion. Uh, the view from 40,000 feet, of course, is all the health related restrictions and associated behavior uh, drove the economy down in a substantial way uh, a little more than a year ago at this point. But the progress we have made on COVID and the economic stimulus combined is bringing the economy back we will have, when the new data comes out, we will find the U.S. economy is fully recovered from the contraction sometime during the second quarter. Uh, we're positioned now for a great second half. Wisconsin has already returned to full employment uh, and labor markets are actually, at this point, enhancing our recovery. Roughly a year ago, um, first and second quarters, 2020, uh, 20, you had a terrible re economic result in the first quarter, made even worse in the second quarter. That second quarter, 2020, was the worst economic quarter in US economic history. John, could you hold on a second? Sure. I'm getting word from our other folks that the screen isn't showing right now. So if you don't mind. I will let you solve it. I'll just. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, well, <laughs> you tell me when you get it right. All right. I can, I can be spontaneous. It's easier for me to talk over here anyway. Which one are you on? You're on right about there. So you had it all right for Peter and you just met for me. Is that how this goes? Yeah, oh, John, I heard like there, John. I guess so, you know. Right really like <laughs> all right, let me get out of this. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's I'm not familiar with that area. I trade like it. <laughs> I don't know where this one is. The rest of your audience, can they do they have it? Because I've got that double slide view. Let me go back again. Let's see. Well, I fixed that before. Well, go ahead. Why don't you just keep going and let me? All right. It, in a single month, uh, the U.S. economy basically took 20 years worth of job growth and it were entirely wiped out. It was that devastating. And there we go. As we have seen the economy come forward, there's now a split. Uh, the good side recovered very quickly, probably even by June in terms of spending. Services is still lagging. While total has now moved above pre-recession levels, you weren't there right away. Um, what has happened now is we have crossed the infle inflection point. The big change was on April 5th, all Wisconsin citizens became eligible for vaccination. As Peter highlighted all that good data, and you'll see some of it coming forward, that is what's allowed the service sector to come back online in a big way. 
Following that, in addition, we've had now three rounds of stimulus, and the additional stimulus provides support for expansion, particularly in the second half. And now, of course, with expanded employment opportunities, it's actually inspiring more people to return to work. We we're trying. Now I've lost this. There we go. Uh, the key to recovery is the drive to herd immunity. As Peter highlighted, 51% of the population is at least one dose. Here in Portage, Portage County, it's at about 48% of the population. Where we've really received the results on the COVID contraction, it's not just the vaccination rates, we can see it in our case data. We are down to, as of the data pulled out of last Monday, uh, roughly a seven day moving average of about 184 cases for last seven days compared to 500 last year, and more impressively compared to 6,800 during the peak of it. Hospitalizations are down to, we're running at about six new hospitalizations uh, on average over the seven days. That's down from over 300. Substantial progress in terms of what we needed to have achieved. Portage County is seeing the same thing. Your seven day moving average of cases is now down to about two. Uh, and in terms of hospitalizations, it's even less than one. The big news is this one. If there is to be a marker for success of our results on COVID, it is as of July 18th, the seven day moving average for COVID related deaths in the state of Wisconsin was the number we are all striving for, and that's zero. It's down substantially from roughly 66 in early December. Now, supporting all of this, all of the good news is this was the precondition to get everything back to up and running. The support that we receive on the stimulus package sets it into the second gear, and then we can get moving more sharply. Total stimulus package, as Peter highlighted a lot of the details, but it was 1.9 trillion, including enhanced unemployment benefits, stimulus checks, support for state and local government, education, expanded tax credits, et cetera, all of which has worked. In terms of the personal income, the governor, government transfer payments brought up total personal income in first quarter 2021. That surge in all of that support payment has allowed consumption spending now to exceed pre-recession levels. And at the same time, personal savings is up ahead of pre-recession levels. That allows you to have all of this money set aside here, even if it isn't sent out immediately, it can support additional spending over the next six months to two years. Personal income itself, in terms of the components, wage and salary income is now above pre-recession levels. If we consider it less transfers, uh, we're slightly below, but wage and salaries is ahead. For us, uh, our first quarter of personal income in 2021 was up 18% boosted largely by some of the stimulus payments, but the good news is on, for us, it's on the wage and salary side as well. In terms of our wage and salaries are now running way ahead of pre-recession levels. That's why we've had good uh, tax collection returns. If we think in terms of personal income and we will set aside the transfers and we will do it, set it aside, adjust it for inflation, are we ahead or behind where we were in terms of the real economy if we can set aside all those one-time things? The good news is we are in fact are. As of first quarter, real personal income in Wisconsin excluding transfer payments was ahead. Where the art of the stimulus package comes in is on the, the proprietary side. Uh, Non-farm proprietor's income actually is ahead of pre-recession levels, but if you exclude the transfers and all those programs that Peter highlighted, it would actually be down yet. The same is true for, uh, this is the non-farm side, this is the non-farm side. In both cases, those PPP programs and CARES programs kept the small businesses up and running and viable to set up the employment gains we're expecting in the second half. If we go by key industries, the value of construction put in place has been led by uh, the rebound in residential construction. Residential construction is running way ahead of pre-recession levels. Uh, we can see it in our own data in Wisconsin <coughs> housing construction. Building permits for the state of Wisconsin right now is running at a 12 year high. It's so solid. And in terms of where we see our gains, in all of 2020, we actually had a growth in building permits of almost 12% over prior year. Basically, the states are in green or blue, have better than double digits. If you were red, 
you actually had a decline in the number of building permits. The situation is substantially different if we considered ourselves to the south, east, or west. We had a stronger housing environment than all our surrounding states. The good news on the manufacturing is part of that goods recovers manufacturing new orders are at an all time uh, a new high. And we're seeing the rebound in uh, manufacturing right now based on the industrial production index. Uh, we, while you dropped a stunning 20% over two months, we rebounded 24%. We're almost back to pre-recession levels in total. It depends critically on the industry. Some industries are actually running ahead, but some industries like automobiles right now are being constrained by part shortages. We'll get to that. For Wisconsin-based industries, these are the ones that Wisconsin has a large presence and it's furniture, motor vehicles, fabricated metals, machinery, primary metals, electrical equipment, computers, I don't have to spell that right. Um, we're all seeing huge double digit increases compared in first quarter 2020, actually May, year to date. This is data as of May. The first five months of this year compared to the first five months of this year, we are running the double digits we need. In terms of as we are seeing the rebounding, we're tracking the sort of the pace of the manufacturing recovery. Data reported from June, this is the Purchasers Manage Index, the blue is the US, the red is Wisconsin. We are running consistently, we're about two thirds of manufacturers reporting expanding business. We've had that now for over five months in a row. That's extremely rare. We've got highs previously, but rarely do we see it consistently month after month that we're seeing right now. It's partly because our export industry is recovering. When you had all of those shutdowns and everybody else ceased the orders worldwide, you had the big decline, those orders are coming back on stream. If there is a constraint to manufacturing, it is a supply side one. Uh, what is holding back some of the manufacturing growth is whether or not you can get the parts to build the product. Uh, and it's pervasive. Uh, and of course, the headline one is uh, semiconductors. The other thing, of course, is rising material prices is affecting it. That's because those supply issues still have to work out. The big news for us is uh, where we had our biggest job losses, like everybody else, was in leisure and hospitality. Uh, we lost like 150, almost 150,000 jobs in leisure and hospitality over the course of two months. That is coming back. But if you go back to that very simple point that I made relative to as the COVID contraction has been brought under control and all the restrictions are being removed, leisure and hospitality is coming back. Considering Wisconsin summer activities last year that did not happen, all of them are coming online right now. Our unemployment rates right now is we have the 11th lowest unemployment rate in the country at about 3.9%. If you consider 4% uh, to be full employment, we are one of the few states that actually can say that. And we have a lower unemployment rate than all of our surrounding states. Uh, every metropolitan area of the state of Wisconsin uh, has an unemployment rate well below the national average and compared to some of our counterparts. We've recovered at this point 281,000 of our jobs lost or almost 70% of the job losses have been recovered. Employment's up 11% since April, 2020. There is a divide by the industry. You've had these huge declines here, leisure, hospitality, et cetera. We are getting some of that back, leisure and hospitality. The one that I would flag is actually local government where we had some big declines because local schools were closed. We haven't gotten those jobs back yet, but that's just a matter of time. The day after Labor Day, schools come back online and those job losses should be coming back too. Um, the household measure of employment is a different one. It's a sort of, you ask people whether or not they're working. By this standard, we are practically back to full recovery at this stage. That would include those persons that are working remotely for other companies out of state. Um, that would include people that actually commute to a different area, but they're working from, say, St. Croix County or Kenosha County, but working in Illinois or Minnesota, respectively. Um, and it also doesn't pick up self-employed or proprietor's employment. If we pick that up in the household survey, we're showing much stronger gains than just in the establishment side. Peter alluded to the, we're returning to those days of the labor shortage that we saw two years ago. And indeed, that is the case in terms of the need for worker training, et cetera. Wisconsin job openings as of March hit an all-time record high, 170,000 job openings in the state of Wisconsin. At this point, we are back to those days where we have more job openings than we have people unemployed. 
we're roughly running the same levels we were in pre-pandemic levels. The good news is when people see the economy coming back, they see job openings, they're inspired to come back into the labor force. Our labor force right now is above pre-pandemic levels again. Uh, and in terms of our participation rate, it's returning roughly back to the pre-pandemic levels. In both cases, the horizontal line corresponds to February, the last day of the expansion. All right, for uh, Wisconsin, U.S. economic outlook, uh, we are at this point only like four tenths of a percent as a first quarter below the pre-pandemic peak. Uh, second quarter is going to be ahead of that. Uh, we are expecting full recovery for real GDP to be complete 2021 uh, second quarter, and we switch to expansion third quarter, where we're at right now. Uh, for employment tends to lag, we're not expecting full employment to be fully recovered until fourth quarter 2022, although that's probably, given some of the more recent employment data, I'm more optimistic we'll be lifting that coming up. For Wisconsin, our real GDP was up 6.1%, 6 6% uh, 6 in the first quarter. We are now within 1.5% of pre-pandemic levels, and if we did it on a non-farm basis, we've been with 1%. The farm sector tends to be a swing for us. Farm sector first quarter didn't have a really great quarter that year. We should be coming back to that. Um, we, right now, our Wisconsin recovery reflects the goods and services divide like I expected. Real GDP is positive in when running ahead of pre-recession levels in the industries in green. We are below um, in those industries that are in red. Total private, like I said, is only 1% off. Where our big losses are is accommodations, food service, arts, entertainment, and recreation. Those are exactly the industries that are coming back online right now. For our economic outlook, uh, we expect that the full employment rate to be achieved first quarter 2021. Indeed, that's the case. We're expecting our annual average to be below four uh, going forward for the next three years. Uh, in terms of non-farm employment, uh, and by that metric, we're expecting to be fully recovered by uh, late 2022. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, our turnaround started already in third quarter, and we're actually tracking ahead of our forecast at this stage for uh, average manufacturing employment. Leisure and hospitality rebuild will take some time, maybe with some very good results in terms of just the tourism that will follow shortly. A large part of it is whether or not those entrepreneurs that didn't decided to close shop, we will take some time for their replacements to come forward. Uh, in terms of personal income, once all the stimulus money wears off, I've highlighted that we've had very good wage and salary growth. That's going to offset all of those uh, phase outs. We're expecting solid personal income growth starting in uh, 2023, even discounting all of that. At that stage, I have to hand it off to Emily because presumably we're on the clock. All right, thank you, John. And Emily, you want me to bring up to your question. Emily? Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm sorry I'm not able to be there up in Stevens Point today, but I'm going to show you some of the data we have um, for your local area. Um, give me just a second to get my um, my slides up here. Where is the? There we go. Okay. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, I'm gonna go through some slides. Some of my data will be similar to what John talked about, but I'm gonna focus more on data specific to Portage County. Um, some of the data lags a little bit what we have for the county, but some of it's pretty, um, pretty up to date. Um, I'm gonna start by looking at employment growth, and this is for Portage County and for Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin's the red line there, and Portage County is the blue, and this goes from 2001 until 2020. I'm not sure how everyone's able to see all the numbers and everything, but we're looking at the employment change since 2001. And you can see that Wisconsin and Portage County had pretty similar, pretty similar growth. Um, Portage County did a little better during the Great Recession than Wisconsin did um, and didn't see quite as large of um, declines. Um, you can kind of see that we were increased out of the Great Recession all the way to 2019. And then, of course, the fall in 2020 when employment declined by about 6%, um, both in Wisconsin and in Portage County. Um, let's see here. 
Um, now, employment over time has shifted towards services, and we can see this both in Wisconsin and in Portage County. Um, the first two bars there is Wisconsin again in the red and Portage in the blue, and this is for 2001, um, the share of employment that's in service providing industries. And uh, Portage was a little bit higher already at about 73%, Wisconsin at about 70%. Um, and one of the big differences was manufacturing. The fan manufacturing is a goods pr producing employment sector, um, and it's much higher in Wisconsin than in Portage County. Um, fast forward to 2019, um, service providing industries have grown in their total share of employment, um, and they're actually equal now for both Wisconsin and Portage at about 74.5%. Um, and I'll take a closer look at the 2020 employment change just for um, uh, for all the different sectors for Wisconsin and Portage County. And you can see that pretty much across the board, all sectors saw declines. Um, I know you might not be able to read all the, the letters here, but the, the first two bars there are total employment. And again, Wisconsin's in the red and Portage is in the blue. And both Wisconsin and Portage saw 5% declines um, in total employment in 2020. You've got mixed results, um, three to 5% declines in most industries. The information sector in Portage, Wisconsin had pretty strong growth of 8%, but it's such a small percent of total employment that that only works out to a little less than 20 new jobs in that industry for Portage County. Um, the biggest declines, of course, were in leisure and hospitality at over 20% for both Wisconsin and Portage County, and then other services. And that's a range of things from um, dry cleaning to haircuts. People just didn't get that done as much in 2020 and employment declined. Um, oh, back to this a little bit. Um, I don't have uh, updated information for Portage County and employment, but for Wisconsin, of course, we are seeing recovery in most of these industries, um, still down about four or 5% um, compared to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, now we're gonna take a look at personal income, and this is personal income growth. Um, every year compared to the prior year. And I only have this data through 2019 for Portage County. But you can see that Wisconsin and Portage County performed um, mostly the same. The biggest difference is actually way back in the 70s, Portage County was growing a lot faster than Wisconsin. Um, and you can see the big dips during the Great Recession. Um, now, as John mentioned, we did not see a decline in personal income for Wisconsin in 2020. And I wouldn't expect that we'd see one in Portage County either. Um, this year shows 2019 per capita personal income by um, county, and uh, Portage County kind of falls in the middle. It's about $47,000 per person um, in 2019. Um, Wisconsin comes in at 53000 So Portage County is about 89% of the state level. Um, if we go way back to the beginning of this series, Portage County was a smaller percent of the state at about 80%. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is, of course, the cost of living in Portage County is lower than it would be at the state average. So even though the personal income is is lower, it kind of works out to um, a similar level of um, just total all costs. Um, this next chart here is uh, sales tax distributions. And I really like the sales tax data because we have up to the date data for all the counties that have a sales tax. So this goes from 2019 to th 2021. Um, and you can kind of see that we started off um, with growth throughout 2019 and then it just completely flattened off in 2020 um, as we took a hit to sales tax collections um, in the early part of the pandemic. And then in 2021, it's just taken off in the second quarter as you know the economy's reopened and people have been out spending money it's also helped that we've gotten those stimulus packages that certainly helped in the second quarter of 2020 and also the first quarter of 2021 and the second quarter of 2021. Um, John alluded to this a little bit and I have a, just some more detail here to show, but we've had very large shifts in consumer spending. Um, you know, not being able to go out to bars and restaurants or to travel, people instead spent money on goods, either to improve their homes or on recreational equipment. Um, toys for their kids, books, that kind of thing. Um, so retail trade sales grew quite a bit in 2020. Um, we saw just declines in information, very large declines, about 23% in accommodation and food. So that's your hotels, bars, and restaurants. And then a nearly 16% decline in other services. Um, and this data here, this is specific to Portage County. But we saw similar trends in Wisconsin and then of course across the United States. Um, and as a result of this, as we shifted money, you know, of course, the, the share of total sales that were in retail trade grew in Portage County um, relative to other um, other sectors. So accommodation and food, you know, went from 11 percent of total 
taxable sales in 2019 to 8.4% in 2020, where retail trade went from 53% to over 57% in the same year. Um, and of course, I don't think this will surprise anyone, but everybody spent more money online last year, especially in that second quarter as the pandemic hit and people were afraid to go shopping. So this chart here shows retail sales as a percent of total sales. And this is for the United States, um, going all the way back to 1999. And it's just been a slow and steady increase over time. Um, Pre-pandemic, it was right about 11.5% or so. Um, and then it spiked in the second quarter of 2020. And it's kind of fallen back down. But the trend overall is still much higher than it was pre-pandemic. The question is, will that return um, to kind of the, the slightly lower level but still growing? Or will it stay elevated where it is right now? Um, so I'm going to move from retail sales now to residential values, um, and this is based on the Equalized Values Report that Wisconsin Department of Revenue puts out every year. Um, and this is really interesting because we can not only look at Portage County, we can actually zero into Stevens Point, which is the gray line there. Um, Wisconsin is the red, and then Portage County is the blue. And this is the change since 2008, um, the change in residential values. And you can see that Wisconsin had the steepest decline in residential values um, between 2008 and 2013 following the crash of the housing market and the Great Recession. Um, and then Portage County and Stevens Point um, didn't have quite as big of a decline and everyone's grown since then. Um, in 2020, and this is based on January 1st values, so we don't really have any of the increases that we've actually seen since the beginning of the pandemic in residential values, but they're up about 36% in Stevens Point and 28% in Portage County, or statewide up 17% since 2008. Um, we can look at the same data for commercial values and her commercial properties. And this one is actually a little bit different. Portage County and Stevens Point saw a steeper decline um, following the Great Recession, but has since recovered more strongly. Um, values are up 47% in Stevens Point and 41% in Portage County versus 35% statewide. Um, and this one is median home prices. This also comes from the Department of Revenue, but this is based on real estate transfer tax returns or real estate transfer fee returns that we get back. And so it covers all home sales not just those covered by the Wisconsin, um, what is it, multiple listing service sales, but everything that's considered an arm's length sale. Um, and so you can kind of see that the prices have, of course, risen in 2020. And this is an average of the whole year, although, I'm sorry, these are median prices over the whole year. But for Wisconsin, median home prices are up to 207, 500. Um, Portage County at 185, and then Stevens Point at 154. Um, and then the last thing I want to show, this is just a quick visit. This is something that um, Secretary Barca also mentioned. Um, this is what view from one of our visits or data visualizations that we have on our website, looking at a pretty or taking a pretty detailed look at um, equalized property values. And this is for this view right here is for the city of Stevens Point. Um, you can find that on our website. And that's all I have today. Um, we will make copies of the PowerPoints available in case anyone couldn't quite catch all that. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, quick. And will it show? Sure. I need to show screen. Okay. Oh, I might be sure screen now. Yeah. Get your yep. Get where you need to go. Need a new window to school or whatever. So David Casey, our deputy secretary from the <laughs> Department Sorry. of Revenue, is setting up um, uh, to show you our Department of Revenue website and where you can go to get the data that Emily and the secretary mentioned, our so data visualizations. It's um, located right on the front page of our website. Sure. Uh, we're going to share screen so that the folks online can see as sure. well. And we yeah. have some fun trivia about Tortage County so we can look up sure. the answers and you can see how you can access the state go. of the state. It's very helpful for you in all kinds of ways in your businesses and regional issues, et cetera. Thank you, <laughs> That's I was technically getting set up. Um, so I, I heard John and Emily and Secretary Varga all were referencing different data points. And at the end of the Secretary's slides, there's a reference to our reports page. And I just thought I'd show a couple things real quickly so you could see it. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a data nerd and really like being out there looking at the data and it's a, it's a great resource. So if you're on the main revenue page, just revenue.wi.gov, 
we have a quick links that you can go to the reports page. We have all of our reports that the agency is required to statutorily uh, provide. We also have a, these visualizations. Um, I'll say lots of fun. So on the visualizations, you can go out and um, there were a couple that, that came up. For instance, um, you wanna know what the uh, commuter patterns are for Stevens Point. So do you think more people commute into Stevens Point or out of Stevens Point? Yeah. Yeah. So you can go look at that. And charge them to leave. Charge them to leave. <laughs> Good strategy, right? Like a reverse toll. Great revenue idea. Okay. So you can go click into that, look at the commuter patterns, and oh, let's see, get it up. I believe I'm right over it. That was pretty close. Cool. Oh, it's going to be hard to find it exactly, isn't it? There, there we go. So total jobs net 8,098 uh, come in versus uh, leaving. So you can find that for any of the information anywhere in the state. Uh, that's just one of our visualizations. Um, let's see, it's probably jumping around. I need to close it out of that window. It's not going to let me. Alt F4. What did you say? Alt F4. I should minimize that. Yeah. I want to. I'm going to have to not share it. How to get rid of that? Either that or. Oh, yeah, how do you get rid of that bar? Well, you don't. Let's zoom. You can move it. Click, click on it, hold, and drag it to the bottom bar. Ah, that's what I wanted. Okay. So I can get rid of that. I go back over here. Let me see another question I had. Oh, uh, what's the average price of agricultural sales in Portage County? Agricultural sales. Land. Property sales. Land. Uh, 4,200 an acre. Hmm. Any other guesses? I'll say 5,100 an acre. Oh, so This is a Kenosha. It only depends on the So with this, we have our, our agricultural land sales. And we can, so we have agricultural stats all over the place. And we come down here. Yeah. And uh, average price was three thousand seven forty nine, and there were seven sales totaling four hundred nine acres in twenty twenty. Not a, not a lot of sales. I was surprised, and then I, so that's a couple of the questions I also like. I mean, we have we talk about these, but we have data all over the place. We've got personal income distribution, the county sales tax distributions. Uh, one of my personal favorites is the local government dashboard. All of the expenditures and revenue for every single municipality in the county. So, you know, what was the spend on public safety versus recreation uh, for the revenue sources? Um, I know that one, everybody. That's it. That's a cool one. Uh, the police and fire protection. Couple the MSA, others. The MSA. Yeah, I was going to say, get down to the MSAs. We've got all the MSA data. So, this is personal income, unemployment rates, housing. A number of the data points that you saw that were presented were captured out of here. So, I, I think it's kind of fun to just wander through here. Um, they're all interactive. You can drill in, drill out. And then with each one of these, you can also download the, the source data. So it's all available. Um, It'll to get downloaded right into a PowerPoint slide, so you can use it in mm -hmm. your presentation. Economic yeah. indicators as it relates to the price of a pint. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here we've got yeah. Employment, employment, labor force, earnings, exports, all of that's on the Wisconsin economic indicators. And our. I think our team is very good at putting it into a visualization that's easily accessible and provides the information that you want to see. So that's all. I just wanted to highlight that and let you actually dive in and see some of it. Take some questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I moved it, didn't I? I didn't realize that was a tricky That's good.
So we have some question Q and A for a few minutes. Do we have some time? Okay. Anybody have some questions for Secretary Barker or John or Emily? Anybody? There might be some in the chat. Oh yeah, let me Let's check the old. That old. Start. I want a theory question. We've got a three point nine percent unemployment rate, mm -hmm. but you can drive around town, and a vast majority of businesses have a help wanted sign. Mm -hmm. Why isn't our unemployment rate zero? Well, <laughs> it'll never be zero. I don't right? understand yeah, that. Right? Yeah, Peter, but, Peter's right. But, but basically, you know, why are we even at, I mean, it's low, 3.9%, but why is it that low? And I mean, why is it higher than, than zero? Right. Uh, because we have so many positions that are open. Right. And I would echo that it's a crisis. Right. It's at a crisis yeah. level. Right. And it's it's, it's and broad all the data that that was shown. It's fabulous. There's all this money out there available, but it doesn't matter if these small businesses can't open their doors right. because they don't have employees. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what is being done to drive that unemployment down to stop the incentive to keep these people home? If you're a single mom now with two children, you are way better off to stay home and go work. And we've got to change that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in a crisis mode. I work for her insurance. We ran an Indeed ad. I did it as an experiment. I got 26 replies. I reached out to every, or our HR department reached out to every single one of them saying, please come in for an interview. We could only schedule four interviews. One person showed, we hired them and they lasted four days. Four days. Oh. How do you run a business when you can't get employees even to come and show up for an interview. It's a crisis. Yeah. Well, why don't you stack up first because you can talk well, about the structural <clears throat> nature of why you're always going to have at least two or three percent. There's, there's a couple of things going on. I'll jump which in. is uh, while the state average is three nine, we have metro areas, and I, I would suspect you're in this territory too, where it's three. And that's totally frictional. That, it's uh, the only reason it would be 3-9, we have select metro areas like Milwaukee, Racine, Janesville, for which it is a, a percentage or two higher than that. But for most areas, uh, the rest of the state, we're, we're running that long. The second thing is relative to your concern. I think one of the things holding us back is um, the school closures. Uh, and that's going to resolve in, in a day after Labor Day. And if you're worried about extended unemployment benefits, that also resolves the day after Labor Day. So it's some of the underlying conditions of short life. What I highlighted in my comments and, and Peter's focus on unemployment training, this is not something we haven't seen before. This is where it was before the pre-pandemic. I would say it's way worse. I would um, agree. Judging, you know, my, my quick rule of thumb is to judging labor markets is how often when I'm listening to Brewer's radio broadcasts am I hearing employers advertising on radio. That was actually something I learned here that this was sort of a thing. Um, and it, I wouldn't disagree with you. I think it's substantial. But the um, mayor is right. But there is not a business in Portage County that is not trying to hire right now. Not I, one. I, I don't doubt that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. Um, the, the other thing that I'm noticing uh, and it may be affecting you, but as I've gone out to other groups, um, you have, with the ability to work remotely, you're having other states try to take our workforce, because you don't have to leave the address, right? You can just mm -hmm. dial into something else. So, um, so I think you're absolutely right. But um, it's, it's one of the other dislocations we've had with the pandemic, talking to another manufacturer, he related to, as we think of in terms of youth apprenticeship programs and getting the high school to work pipeline, that was disrupted. Um, so I think um, some of the issues are extremely short term, like at this point, less than six weeks, um, which is why and if I were to cycle circle of data, it's the day after Labor Day, things should improve. But also that pipeline from high schools to employers gets reestablished. And it was disrupted. So part of it is some of the usual way that people would get connected fell off. But you are already seeing the labor force numbers come back. And they're coming back very strong for us right now. But it wasn't really taking off until starting in the spring. So uh, I would also, I don't know if there's any data on the unemployment number for those that are actually out looking versus those who have quit looking. Ah, um, in this, it's very simple. If you've quit looking, you're not counted at all. Right. You're not unemployed. Right. There are those that may have, the, the issue then becomes 
we bringing those folks that have sort of hit, forget it, I'm done, I'm not doing this, bringing them back into the labor force again. That, that will be the longer term challenge. But as we're seeing to see our labor force data come back up, and it's coming up uh, quickly, I think that will follow. But the, the requirement to actively seek employment was only recently reestablished. That That's correct? relative to unemployment benefits. I was right. talking to the okay. household survey as to um, whether or not you're counted as employed or unemployed. Yeah. And I think a lot of the challenges are trying to figure out why people aren't taking these jobs. And I think it's probably a bunch of things. Uh, you, you know, you're referring to the extra three hundred dollars. I think that's only a small piece of it. But I, I also think that this is going to sound really bad. But I think parents are coddling their their kids longer. I've got a twenty five year old nephew, married, two kids, lives with his mother in law, doesn't have a driver's license, and works when he feels like it because he can. Well, he, he can get a job tomorrow. He doesn't like it yet. I quit. I'm good for a while. You go back up, you know, a week from Tuesday, and you get another job because the market is such that you have demand. I mean, I've heard of places that are waiving the mandatory drug test. You know, okay, get high, but don't do it at work, please. Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. We still need you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've experienced in the city the same things that you've experienced. We, you know, we had four qualified candidates. We, we called interview or called a set of interviews. They all confirmed they were going to be at the interview. Two of them showed up. One looked like you just got off a boat, you know, beach boat kind of thing. You know, shorts and flip flops and what have you. Let me let me highlight a couple things though because it is a, a very real problem, and there are things that can be done policy wise. I mean, first of all, is uh. As you know, John indicated, that come September, some of this will filter out because unemployment benefits will end. People will have more child care with schools opening back up again. But let's talk about child care for a second because the expense of child care is extremely expensive right now. So, having things like child care credits, which you saw we did do a little bit there, but there's far more we could do. Having uh, credits for people, for caregivers, people have to care for elderly parents, that keeps people out of the, child, out of the workforce. Things of that sort actually do make a difference. Now, one good news thing I can tell you is that we actually, believe it or not, have more child care spots available now than we did pre-pandemic. Our children and families group has worked extremely hard to try and license more people, make it easier for them. But we can't so find employers, no, no. employees. Oh, we, yeah. have, we have a huge list of people. We can't find employees for daycare. We have a huge list of people that want daycare, right. but we can't find employees to fill the slots right. to be able to provide the daycare. Right. Well, and let me say, so another factor, I think, okay, we'll talk about daycare and we'll come to that point. But another thing is, is the workforce training, having more workforce training available for people so that people feel comfortable taking some of these slots. Also, trying to move people to their highest level so that, you know, let me give you an example. So I work with people with disabilities early in my career, you know. More work could be done through people with disabilities who really want to work more. So as you can get people trained so they can, you know, move up into different slots and have more, you know, routine kinds of jobs being done by people with disabilities, that would make a difference. But training always makes a difference because the degree to which people are trained better, they're going to be more effective at doing their jobs. They're going to find ways to mechanize certain things that maybe haven't been mechanized in the past. But, but the other thing I want to emphasize, this problem isn't going away because we have a demographic issue. You have far more people retiring now than you have young people entering the workforce. So that's where it's going to take our imagination as community leaders, as policymakers, to think of other things that we can be doing that you know, entice people to go into the workplace, have maybe people who are older take part-time jobs, Employers can pay a role by maybe offering part-time work where in the past maybe you only had full-time work. But that way you can attract certain people maybe that have been retired that'd be happy to work two or three days a week. So I think it's going to take also a private-public partnership for us to work together to find out these strategies, share these strategies, and I think that'll make a difference. So we're, we are examining these items now. This kind of feedback is helpful. I think also as you find success, you know, sharing that, you know, through uh, organizations such as this one um, will make a difference too. But, but it's a real issue and it's going to get worse before it gets better. But that's where even like the workforce housing, 
I know in some areas, people can't afford to live in the towns that they're in. So we're gonna to wanna to attract people from other states, other places to come to Portage County. And that's where having funding available. So contractors, whether it's Findor for others that you know maybe could build uh, housing, we need that kind of uh, incentive available as well. I, I'm someone that early in my career, I just thought, well, if there's one thing that should work, it should be housing. I don't think you need the public sector involved. Well, boy, if we ever need involved, now we do, because we have to be able to build affordable housing with lumber costs, as you probably know here better than anybody. You know, these are real challenges, but they're, you know, the good news is I really think with imagination, new policies, new approaches, both by the public and the private sector, I think we can, and I really believe we will make progress. So let me turn it back over to you. John's got a question maybe from the chat there. So it's kind of long, but. Uh, all right, I'll read it out. And pardon me, we'll get to it. Uh, in regards to unemployment and hiring, are there statistics on benefits uh, for eligible positions versus not benefit eligible? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that question goes, but I would say generally, no. We, we don't have it at that level of granularity. Uh, or remote workers locally working in other states. That is one that we have now flagged and we're waiting to follow through on the data. We haven't seen it yet but our tax collection, for example, is stronger than the employment numbers themselves would suggest, suggesting it is a possibility. Uh, are there data on the impact of pre-employment screenings uh, has on application submissions? Uh, not that I'm aware of. One of the things I love doing these presentations, I get questions that I don't know the answer to, so I'm inspired to go back and find the answer. So while well, you don't get the answer, the next group does. So we keep track of these things and we go back and we keep trying to do the research and reinvent it. All right, employers that are interviewing candidates not accepting the job, are they gathering feedback on why the candidate isn't choosing their employer? Benefits, pay location, shift flexibility. That's not a question I can answer. That's a question I'm gonna to have to put to all of you is, is do you do any of that follow-up? I, can, I would like to know that myself. We, we get some follow-up. Okay. I mean, sometimes it's just no show, no call, no response. Right. Uh, but it's it's a mix. Um, there are several, I'd say the highest one is they got a better offer somewhere else. Yes, I've heard that. Um, yeah. that's, that's probably the leading cause of mm -hmm. us, right. at least. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other factors. We haven't had benefits really come up. Okay. Uh, pay, which is usually part of the better right. offer. Um, location hasn't been too much of a problem either. We do have um, issues with housing and we're working on some affordability options, including uh, allowing accessory okay. dwelling units and things like that. Okay. So that helps a little bit, but there's a, a, you know, there's a pretty decent housing stock in central Wisconsin, maybe not point. Um, and then the flexibility is another one. Very good. Where, where you get younger people who say, okay, but what, I don't get vacation for the first six months? Come on, that, no, that doesn't work for me. Um, they want personal time. Right. Uh, and that usually is in the form of vacation or paid time off. Let me so, jump in for one second, because I think one other thing that's going to be very important for employers is retaining your employees. And, you know, I, I know when psychologists analyze this, pay certainly is an issue, but if you're paying a living wage, what they find is 78% of the time when people leave, it's not over wages. Do they feel content at work? Do they have people at work that they can relate to? Do they feel like their employer cares about them? That, you know, when they have a family member pass away, do you even know about it? Do you even have any idea who these people are? And these are things that I think we need to increasingly share, Todd, you know, share information on as well. Um, because, you know, employees, you know, just because of the demographics, which we all recognize, it's very important that employers be able to retain their people. And it's going to require, you know, having managers that, you know, management training programs. We, we now start our supervisors, we put them through a monthly training program. Every month we have at least, a, you know, an hour and a half or so where we're talking about how you retain people. We have trouble finding people, um, you know, so we don't want people to leave the door. Now we try firing it, but they climb out windows. So we got to try other approaches. Um, but seriously speaking, we do want to make sure that we retain the good people that we have. And part of that is, you know, all of our skills as leaders. Todd? There's another one, I, probably not one that you can maybe answer, but at least acknowledge the question. How can the state engage with the federal government to aggressively and legally increase immigration? Mm -hmm. uh, further, uh, along with that, create targeted training to be ready for the immigrants as they arrive. Immigration, in my opinion, is the only way to increase the workforce numbers far enough to turn the tide and avoid stagnation to engage. 
relative to the first question, Peter, I don't mind. I hope you don't mind handing that off. Sure. You, you've got experience on both sides. Right. Well, I've been the federal level and, and obviously, you know, it's, you know, I think that, you know, part of it is that we have a system. We can open up legal immigration to say we want to allow people from different countries to legally immigrate. And, but I'll tell you right now, a part of it involves a climate too and culturally. I think, you know, I, I have relatives in Italy. My father was an immigrant himself. He came from Italy. And uh, we're still in touch with our country. Some don't want to come here. They feel like this country is not hospitable to immigrants. And I know that's not the case. Obviously, for generations, we've welcomed immigrants. But I think that sometimes that cultural avenue does make a difference. And, but the other side is we got to talk to our federal representatives, explain to them that things can be done to open up legal immigration. You know, and we used to have programs like when my father came to this country, you know, you would sponsor people so that people who are relatives, people who are here could come or you could work through your embassies or they could make people aware of it. So those, you know, it's an excellent point that Andrew brings up here because there are steps that we can take in order to open that up. You know, we have the, the short-term visa immigration program, like I know at Dells, we were there just for the pandemic profile. And, you know, they can bring people in the summers and, you know, and that's another venue. If you bring in students in the summers, they come here and say, oh, what a wonderful place to live here in America. People, you know, this is a great place, a lot of opportunity. Then they'd be more inclined to apply to stay here or to come back here once they finish their education. And, you know, so those are other kinds of techniques. So excellent point, Andrew. Thanks for bringing it up. Is there anything the state is doing to try to incentivize some of these folks who are not working when you're talking about the housing or the health care or whatever it might be to say, if you get a job, we can give you X mm -hmm. instead of just we'll give you X. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, we have got to start pushing the other way because I don't see this tide turning. Right. And if the government sure. doesn't step in and start pushing I just see more business. When you've got Chili's and Stevens Point and they can only open three days a week because they can't get help, yeah. that is a crisis. Yeah, no, it's an excellent point. You bring that up. Uh, and there's no question, I think, that in the pandemic, you know, it would have been ideal if we had structured it so that people were always better off by working than not working. You let them keep that mix of services. In fact, you know, with Governor Thompson, I had chaired the Welfare Reform Conference Committee back when he was governor. And we arranged it that way. We restructured our benefits so people could keep their child care for a period of time, that you could uh, still keep like portions of your benefits. And that's the kind of design we really need to be more effective. Now, in a pandemic, it's almost impossible. You have all these people laid off. John showed you the cliff that we fell off. We just had to get money out the door. We had to help small businesses, do anything we could to help rebuild our economy. But now that we've rebuilt it to a large degree, now we've got to think about how you carefully tailor that benefit structure so you don't have these cliffs people fall off and so that maybe allow people to keep their child care benefits, allow them to stay on medical assistance perhaps for the next six months or, you know, so there are strategies we can employ to make it, and that they, what we always use back then is they make people so they're always better off by working than not working. So why and, did the, uh, government, the governor, I'm sorry, extend the unemployment bonus through the summer when all these Resorts and people are begging for people. Mm -hmm. Well, because I'll, I'll tell you why. Because some people, it's a mixed bag, right? There certainly are people that could have taken jobs and and would have been better off. There's others that are in circumstances where maybe you got two children, uh, maybe you have four kids, two of them are disabled, you're a single parent, you, you just can't even afford the child care to be able to go back. Those to work. kind of situations, I entirely agree, but we have to look at them and we have to say. You're an extenuating circumstance, you are not. Exactly, that's where I think having carefully designed systems can make a difference, but you're not gonna be able to do it in a month, there's a month and a half and, and this program ends anyway. So how are you gonna redesign it in that short time? But longer term, that's a goal we have. We do wanna restructure that so that, that way you can, you know, and that's why things like, you know, again, childcare, I, I wanna emphasize that because it's so vital today. I mean, I can't believe my nieces and nephews when they tell me what it costs them for child care, one works just to pay the child care, and the other one, you know, is the salary they live on. I mean, it's really reaching a few level. And your point earlier about how you train people so you get people to be enticed to go into child care. Well, you know, child care for most daycare centers, I mean, what do you pay? You know, 12, 13, 14 bucks, because that's all you can afford. You know, so we need to come up with structures so you can afford to pay people more and entice people or or maybe we need to have a training program for 
you know, our grandparents may want to come back and work part time or something. Maybe we should because they don't want to raise kids, they raise all of us, right? So, I mean, we've got to be imaginative, we've got to be creative, we've got to think through other approaches so we can have success. I mean, maybe you want to comment on this. And the problem is, you know, actually, there is a lot of stimulus money going to daycare, but you're doing it as one time grants that have to be given out in a short period of time. But you can't raise wages because all of a sudden you raise all the wages, yeah, the, the grant goes away. Sure. Then all of a sudden you're in a losing business proposition. So right, right. The, even the structure of how they've done the stimulus, yeah, it's been great for a lot of our employees. They've had awesome mm -hmm. bonuses, but we haven't been able to raise our wages because what happens, like I said, when the money's gone? Mm -hmm. So it's right. the structure that needs to change. Right, right, right. That's true. And right. how much revenue has been lost because these businesses are shut down? Mm -hmm. because they can't get employees. Right, good point. That's why restaurants and point you make. hospitality Absolutely. is not coming back because they don't have employees. Right, They're having that's, to that's part of it. The I mean, there's mm -hmm. resorts right. in central Wisconsin right now. We were at one last weekend. Big sign on the door. Shut down. Can't find help. Uh, a resort they, gets they, a lot. Yeah. Right. You know, hand those resorts because then Ryan, we did a call with Rhinelander, with the mayor and, and some of the community leaders. We called uh, Rhinelander CPR, Community Pandemic Relief. And what do we need to do in Rhinelander? Just as one example, to bring up a good point. And going back to the housing issue, they say they can't attract people good because they can't afford to live there because the housing costs have just gone through the ceiling up there. So, I mean, these things are all inextricably related and we need to have strategies that are encompassing <coughs> to try to address those. And, you know, they have a new mayor there, sharp guy. Uh, you know, he gets it. A lot of the staff are really talented and they're, they're looking at those things. You were going to talk, sir. I was just wondering if there's, um, you know, some data on kind of addressing that question, I guess, of how many people are sitting out of the economy because of the extra 300 bucks or whatever. Like, I hear that a lot. Yeah. Like, that's the reason well, there aren't any employees. Right. But when you do the math, that's not a huge amount of money for not working. But we'll add it to the base, though. Yeah. Is yeah. there data on how many that? that that kind of is like, is that a huge amount or is it? it, it it's uh, that something it would be, I would love to say I can just go on the internet, do the search and give me a precise number it, that doesn't exist. Sure. Um, I, I will say that if you look at the number of people receiving unemployment compensation, that is falling fairly consistently. And while we're ahead maybe of where we would have been, it isn't that big a number. Um, and as I'm highlighting at this point, where the calendar is ticking in six six weeks, that disappears. So I think we're already seeing people sort of tuning into that and trying to re-enter the labor force because the number of people that are in continuing unemployment compensation claims are way down. I, I think most people would, I, I hesitate to throw up, Emily is here, maybe she can chime in and look it up faster for me because it's released tomorrow. But last I looked, there was about 50,000 people 50,000 continuing claims paid. And that's out of a labor force of 3 million. And that assumes that, and there is always a residual. There's always somebody that loses a job and goes on unemployment all the time anyway. So what you're seeing, part of the thing that I was trying to emphasize, it's a return to the labor shortage you saw beforehand already. And yes, there are certainly some individuals that would be affected by it, but it's probably not as big a number as you think. So the, the gap between pre-pandemic. Yeah, there's a gap between pre-pandemic levels. And yeah, maybe like fifty thousand statewide ish. It is the fifty thousand statewide ish is the total. I mean, routinely it would be thirty. Sure. So uh, I mean, if I generously attribute all of that to that, and I can't. Sure. The, the, you, you know, so the number is smaller than you think, and it's declining. Is my overall impression. Sure. Let's do one more, Corey, well, and, we have and to wrap I up. guess, what is the level of full employment considered? Because, you know, for instance, you're always going to have some amount of unemployment. You, there you because are. people are going to be in between Correct. jobs. There are some people Correct. who, you know, just have a lot of challenges with being in the workforce. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're right. always going to have and, some. and somebody, newly graduated student mm -hmm. looking for their first job, et cetera. Businesses closing, mergers that ends up cutting out jobs, moving jobs overseas. All of a sudden, those people are dislocated. So there's a lot of reasons why you'll never be at zero percent. Mm -hmm. That's why you know what is it? Three percent? It's actually four. 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 What, four. Once you're below four, you're at full employment, and which is why I was highlighting in some of our metro areas, we're at three. So relative to what you're saying is that you can't find enough workers because of that. 
basically just sort of people churning jobs or entering the workforce or leaving the for workforce decide I can't stand working for this person, I'm leaving, I'm going someplace. That's never gonna, you're getting it below two is impossible. Right. So basically what, what you're saying is there's not a crowd of people, you know, that are sitting in their homes, you know, that are waiting to enter the workforce. Well, well relative right to, the, to the discussions of, shall we say, the marginally attached is a good way of putting it, that ah, maybe I'll go to work. I don't, you know, and some of the interviews that you had is, the issue is how do you get the marginally attached into the fully committed workforce? Um, that's probably attitudinal. Um, so as, you said attitudinal. Yes. That, well, relative to the story that we had to the 25-year-old with two kids that decides to work occasionally or not, um, it's how do you move the marginal into it? Keeping the economy in the position it's in right now does tend to nudge those people into the workforce. But while you would love to say it's sort of like ordering, imagine this, people like to think in terms of you can get a workforce by just like we could order semiconductors. Well, we're having supply constraints all over the economy, and I don't care if it's timber or adhesives or labor. Things have ramped up so fast, there is a tremendous recognition lag even among labor as to whether or not, what are the openings out there, which is why I was highlighting that as the markets have gotten tight, you're already seeing the data the labor force is growing again. Well, thank you. We had, we had uh, 36 people, I think, online, another dozen or so here. So we really appreciate you coming up to Central Wisconsin and sharing this. Obviously, some really challenging topics here that we're not going to solve when you guys stayed a half hour late. So John, me, go ahead. thank you. Let me emphasize. I love doing these things because I learned so much yeah. listening to all of you. And you've given me so many ideas to go back and look for. You've given me three weeks worth of work and I'm trying to go on vacation <laughs> somewhere. Let us know his next presentation so we can catch the answers to our questions. <laughs> well, that's actually yeah. true. I, I, yeah. I, I agree. And so I'll, just add, sometime. I'll just add to you, we, you know, that, that is a big part of it. You know, I'll bring this feedback back to our cabinet meetings. We'll discuss this. As we're looking at strategy and say, well, don't forget about this and the impact, you know, like for instance, like your point on, on child care and things of that sort. So we, we are, you know, carefully analyzing each and every one of these. And don't, you know, you can reach us, email anytime, DOR secretary, you know, Wisconsin.gov. Um, feel free to email anytime. If you walk out of here, you think, you know, there's one more thing I should have brought up. You know, do not ever hesitate to reach out to us. So thank you very much, Todd. All right, let's thank our guests and thank you all for being here.